As a reader of alternate universe stories, I just want more alternate universe stories. <laughs> and I think that's the whole idea, is like in a multiverse, any, there can be 10 million versions of you, you know, that have different breakfasts or whatever. So I, I don't know, I, I guess, I hope I'm staying, um, you know, staying away from cliche, but I wasn't too, wor it seems like such fertile ground. And I think that people have an appetite for kind of marveling at the differences that are possible. Uh, even within one made-up alternate universe. All right, so this is the reading part, right? Yeah. Watch me juggle, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Chivalry is not dead. <laughs> uh, my book has a book within a book, so it's about people who are displaced from their own version of New York City and wind up as refugees in ours, and they're craving the people they've lost, but they're also searching for the pop culture and historical, like basically the 20th century went completely differently in the world they're from. Um, am I doing all right with the mic, by the way? Yeah. This is weird. All right, wonderful, thank you so much for that. Uh, so yeah, so this is a section from a fictional book, a novel that, um, which only one copy exists. It was brought over by someone who came from this alternate universe. Uh, so I'm just gonna read really briefly. The interloper came over the ashy ridge one day when Azul and John Gunn patrolled. When they spotted the figure in the distance, they stopped walking to watch his approach. A man moving easily, unencumbered by a protective suit. He wore a cloth mask tied over his nose and mouth and a ragged jacket and pants, the color of the wasteland around them, and shoes, and that was all. To the pyronauts, it was inconceivable that he had not been sickened by the fumes from burned stubble and dying plants all around them but he didn't seem to exhibit any of the typical respiratory symptoms of those few stubborn folk they'd encountered in the past who insisted on living outside the safety of the bunkers. Still, they hailed the stranger at 20 paces to demand that he stop, and stop he did once he saw John Gunn's sidearm leveled at him. He stopped, and he laughed at them. He told them that his name was H. H lingered, conversing with the Pyronauts. He was a strongly built young man with ruddy, untroubled countenance and broad shoulders. Azul, a member of a post-apocalyptic Christian sect whose adherents believed that they had each been personally pulled from the pit by the hands of God, maintained perpetual celibacy as penance. But surely, John Gunn thought to himself, she must notice how handsome the stranger was. John Gunn ordered H to find shelter. He was in violation of the quarantine laws, and anyway, no man could last long out here in the Neverlands. H disagreed. He'd been born in the Never, he said, and there were plenty of others like him who survived off the bounty of those abandoned lands and had never been a sick a day in their lives. Still, when the stranger looked at Azul, taking in her features through the smeared crystal of the faceplate of her suit, he agreed to come with them to the nearest settlement. The three of them walked all day together through the ashy fields of former farmland, and H explained about the quick developing shoots and roots his mother had taught him to find and harvest out in the wastes before the periodic patrols arrived to test and burn. At first, it seemed to John Gunn that H was watching Azul too attentively as he spoke, directing all of his remarks to Azul in a disconcerting manner. It made him feel itchy. Yet as soon as John Gunn developed this opinion, H abruptly turned his attention. He began acting pointing, asking pointed questions of John Gunn instead, questions about his past before the alien's advent. These John Gunn found even more uncomfortable. Azul was well attuned to the, to the topics he preferred not to discuss, but this stranger lacked her sensitivity. Though John Gunn remained unconvinced of the necessity of his protective gear out in the, po out in the remained convinced, excuse me, of the necessity of his protective gear out in the po poisonous open of the wastes, he felt foolish addressing this man whose only barriers against it were fragile cloth and, sk and skin. They walked together as the shadows lengthened, as the silhouette of the skyline of the abandoned city in the distance blurred and grew indistinguishable. When they reached the outskirts, it was time to set up camp. Azul argued that it would be cruel to leave H at the mercy of the wind. At her insistence, the stranger joined them in their tent. As usual, once the seal was set, Azul removed her suit, and John Gunn did not like the way that the stranger watched her then in her modest but clinging undergarments. She touched the man's face mask, and he showed her how it was constructed how he'd cut a salvaged pillowcase into the shape that would cover the lower part of his face, fitting over his short beard. It's not one of those fancy filters like what you've got, H said with a grin, but it's lighter to wear and it keeps the dust out well enough. 
John Gunn himself elected to sleep in full protective gear that night, and he kept his flame pistol close to hand. In order to fit into the two-man tent, they ranged themselves head to foot to head, like the rationed sardines and tins back in the stores of some of the more frugal communities the Pyronauts had visited. John Gunn couldn't sleep for a long time. He watched over the lump Azul's upward pointed toes made in the blanket, the other man's face, eyes scrunched up and lips unselfconsciously parted, baby-like in sleep. Finally, John Gunn's vi vigilance and worry slipped away as he drifted off. In the morning, H was gone. And so is the book, and that's what my book is about. Thank you. I'm going to read from This Is How You Lose the Time War, which is Amal Matar's and my uh, novella, which came out a couple weeks ago. This is from the very beginning. When red wins, she stands alone. Blood slicks her hair. She breathes out steam in the last night of this dying world. That was fun, she thinks, but the thought sours in the framing. It was clean, at least. Climb up time's threads into the past and make sure no one survives this battle to muddle the futures her agencies arranged. The futures in which her agency rules, in which red herself is possible. She's come to knot the strand of history and sear it until it melts. She holds a corpse that was once a man, her hands gloved in its guts, her fingers clutching its alloy spine. She lets go and the exoskeleton clatters against rock. Crude technology, ancient, bronze to depleted uranium. He never had a chance. That is the point of red. After a mission comes a grand and final silence. Her weapons and armor fold into her like roses at dusk. Once flaps of Pseudocin's skin settle and heal and the programmable matter of her clothing knits back together, Red looks again something like a woman. She paces the battlefield, seeking, making sure. She's won. Yes, she has won. She is certain she has won. Hasn't she? Both armies lie dead. Two great empires broke themselves here, each a reef to the other's hull. That is what she came to do. From their ashes, others will rise, more suited to her agency's ends. And yet, there was another on the field, no groundling like the time-moored corpses mounded by her path, but a real player, someone from the other side. Few of Red's fellow operatives would have sensed that opposing presence. Red only knows because Red is patient, solitary, careful. She studied for this engagement, she modeled it backward and forward in her mind. When ships were not where they were supposed to be, when escape pods that should have been fired did not, when certain fusillades came 30 seconds past their cue, she noticed. Twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action. But why? Red has done what she came to do, she thinks. Wars are dense with causes and effects, though, calculations and strange attractors, and all the more so are wars in time. One spared life might be worth more to the other side than all the blood that, red, that stained Red's hands today. A fugitive becomes a queen or a scientist or, worse, a poet. Or her child does or a smuggler she trades jackets with in some distant spaceport, and all this blood for nothing. Killing gets easier with practice and mechanics and technique. Having killed never does for Red. Her fellow agents don't feel the same or they hide it better. It is not like Garden's players to meet Red on the same field at the same time. Shadows and sure things are more their style, but there is one who would. Red knows her, though they've never met. Each player has their signature. She recognizes patterns of audacity and risk. Red may be mistaken. She rarely is. Her enemy would relish such a magic trick, twisting to her own ends all Red's grand work of murder. But it's not enough to suspect. Red must find proof. So she wanders the charnel field of victory and seeks the seeds of her defeat. A tremor passes through the soil. Do not call it Earth. The planet dies. Crickets chirp. Crickets survive for now among the crashed ships and broken bodies on this crumbling plain. Silver moss devours steel and violet flowers choke the dead guns. If the planet lasted long enough, the vines that sprout from the corpses' mouths would grow berries. It won't and neither will they. On a span of blasted ground, she finds the letter. It does not belong. 
Here there should be bodies mounded between the wrecks of ships that once sailed the stars. Here there should be the death and dirt and blood of a successful op. There should be moons disintegrating overhead, ships aflame in orbit. There should not be a sheet of cream-colored paper clean save a single line in a long trailing hand. Burn before reading. Red likes to feel. It is a fetish. Now she feels fear and eagerness. She was right. She searches shadows for her hunter, her prey. She hears infrasonic ultrasound. She thirsts for contact for a new, more worthy battle. But she is alone with the corpses and the splinters and the letter her enemy left. It is a trap, of course. Vines curl through eye sockets, twine past shattered portholes, rust flakes fall like snow, metal creaks, stressed and shatters. It is a trap. It is a trap. Poison would be crude, but she smells none. Uh, perhaps a no-virus and the message to subvert her thoughts, to see to trigger or merely to taint red with suspicion in her commandant's eyes. Perhaps if she reads this letter, she will be recorded, exposed, blackmailed for use as a double agent. The enemy is insidious. Even if this is but the opening gambit of a longer game, by reading it, Red risks Commandant's wrath if she's discovered, risks seeming a traitor, be she never so loyal. The smart and cautious play would be to leave. But the letter is a gauntlet thrown, and Red has to know. She finds a lighter in a dead soldier's pocket. Flames catch in the depths of her eyes. Sparks rise, ashes fall, and letters form on the paper in that same long trailing hand. Red's mouth twists, a sneer, a mask, a hunter's grin. The letter burns her fingers as the signature takes shape. She lets its cinders fall. Red leaves then, mission failed and accomplished at once, and climbs down thread toward home to the braided future her agency shapes and guards. No trace of her remains, save cinders, ruins, and millions dead. The planet waits for its end. Vines live, yes, and crickets, though no one's left to see them but the skulls. Rain clouds threaten. Lightning blooms and the battlefield goes monochrome. Thunder rolls. There will be rain tonight to slick the glass that was the ground if the planet lasts so long. The letters, cinders, die. The shadow of a broken gunship twists. Empty, it fills. A seeker emerges from that shadow, bearing other shadows with her. Wordless, the seeker regards the aftermath. She does not weep that anyone can see. She paces through the wrecks, over the bodies, professional. She works a winding spiral, ensuring with long-practiced arts that no one has followed her through the silent paths she walked to reach this place. The ground shakes and shatters. She finds what was once a letter. Kneeling, she stirs the ashes. The spark flies up, and she catches it in her hand. She removes a thin white slab from a pouch at her side and slips it under the ashes, spreads them thin against the white, removes her glove and slits her finger. Rainbow blood wells and falls and spatters into gray. She works her blood into the ash to make a dough, kneads that dough, rolls it flat. All around, decay proceeds. The battleships become mounds of moss, great guns break. She applies jeweled lights and odd sounds. She wrinkles time. The world cracks through the middle. The ash becomes a piece of paper with sapphire ink in a viny hand at the top. The letter was meant to be read once, then destroyed. In the moments before the world comes apart, she reads it again. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. A little joke. Trust that I've accounted for all variables of irony. Though I suppose if you're unfamiliar with over-anthologized works of early Strand 6, 19th century, the joke's on me. I hoped you'd come. You're wondering what this is, but not, I think, wondering who this is. You know, just as I've known since our eyes met during that messy matter on Abergast 882, that we have unfinished business. I shall confess to you here that I'd been growing complacent, bored even with the war. Your agencies flash and dash up thread and down, gardens patient planting and pruning of strands burrowing into time's braid. Your unstoppable force to our immovable object, less a game of go than a game of tic-tac-toe, outcomes determined from the first move, endlessly iterated until the split, where we fork off into unstable chaotic possibility, 
the future we seek to secure at one another's expense. But then you turned up. My margins vanished. Every move I'd made by rote I had to bring myself to fully. You brought some depth to your side speed, some staying power, and I found myself working at capacity again. You invigorated your shift's war effort and in so doing invigorated me. Please find my gratitude all around you. I must tell you, it gives me great pleasure to think of you reading these words and licks and whirls of flame, your eyes unable to work backwards, unable to keep the letters on a page. Instead, you must absorb them and knit them into your memory. In order to recall them, you must seek my presence in your thoughts, tangled among them like sunlight and water. In order to report my words to your superiors, you must admit yourself already infiltrated. Another casualty of this most unfortunate day. This is how we'll win. It is not entirely my intent to brag. I wish you to know that I respected your tactics. The elegance of your work makes this war seem like less of a waste. Speaking of which, the hydraulics in your spherical flanking gamut were truly superb. I hope you'll take comfort from the knowledge that they'll be thoroughly digested by our mulchers, such that our next victory against your side will have a little piece of you in it. Better luck next time, then. Fondly, Blue. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start at the beginning, as many people do. A very good place to start. I think so. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of curious for both of you, for these books or Empress of Forever, which came out in June, uh, where do you start with a piece? Do you start with a big idea? Do you start with a character, an image, a setting? For this book or others, I assume for many writers it's different for every story, I guess. Whoever. How do we do this? Yeah. <laughs> Wrestle the microphone. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, this is my first book, so I'm interested to hear what Max has to say. Thank you, having written several. But um, <laughs> I, I feel I came from the world of short stories, and in short stories, it, they usually come from a character, but this book definitely came from a concept, from a, a world, from an idea. And that was, that was different for me, and I had to find the characters later. What do you think? That's, that's fantastic. Did, had you written any sort of longer work no, and then trying to, this is the first time you, that's amazing. That's so cool. It took me like four or five tries to even get something that looked vaguely novel shaped at the end of it. Um, I, you know, I, I find myself also going um, from a world concept in, though that takes different forms from book to book. Um, I think it's, the world becomes an angle, and then you start asking yourself questions about who lives here, who drives it, who's the motivating power, who's overlooked, who's not in the driver's seat, and what would they have to say about the situation. For these uh, two books, um, This Is How You Lose the Time War and Empress of Forever, which yeah, that also came out in June, um, they have very different genesis. Um, this Is How You Lose the Time War, I knew that I wanted to be working with Amal Mutar, my co-author, and from that, we have very similar interests in fiction, but we have pretty dissimilar styles. And we wanted to do something that could give both of our rhythms and styles a lot of freedom. So that suggested a sort of two-handed form for the story. We liked the epistolary format because on top of narrative, it allowed us to get some text and, and force the characters into conversation with one another. So there's this sort of shared letter space, even though the characters are very rarely, if ever, meeting in the sort of actual narration. And from there, a number of sort of science fictional conceits suggested themselves very quickly on, uh, on top of that. The notion of the time war, of sort of competing agents of different sides. Um, for Empress of Forever, I... Ooh. That's, a, that's a very complicated question. Um, I wanted to write a story in which somebody who is very recognizably of our time or of a near future, um, the, the main character in Empress is uh, Vivian Liao. She's a woman in a sort of dark 10 to 20 years in the future of the United States of America. She's sort of a significant figure in the tech industry, and, but is for all of that unable to affect any real change. And, has one last ditch uh, attempt to try to save the world, conquer it, whatever, as the net is closing in, uh, tries to go for it and 
basically gets surprised by a sort of otherworldly figure in the basement of a Boston server farm and wakes up several thousand years in the future trying to figure out what happened, how she can get back, how she can see her friends um, again, and sort of has to participate in the galactic revolution along the way. And that's the first two chapters. And <laughs> for that book, I, I wanted something that I think like a lot of people in late 2016, early 2017, I was having a lot of complicated feelings about politics in the world and the uh, space that telling things in realistic space can sometimes be very difficult to address deep feelings head on. At least that's how I feel. I don't know if that's how you feel. Um, and the notion of having someone who is facing a lot of the same things or feeling a lot of the same feelings that I was feeling in some place where those feelings could really unfurl, like this sort of Oz-like far future space was, uh, it just uh, was a fertile ground for me then. Anyway, sorry, going on, I guess, too much. So going off of that, of starting with the idea, of starting or having a big idea in speculative fiction to then kind of build your world off of, um, what I've read of Max's work and Famous Men Who Never Lived they both have, they have these big ideas, but they're all, they also feel immensely personal to me. The characters engage with those big ideas and all the chaos that might be happening or the changes that might be happening in these deeply personal ways. Do you find, uh, a, that a, do you find it ever a difficult balance to get between the big idea and the, and the personal character, or do you find yourself pushing one way or the other? Can I jump on this one? Yeah. Uh, also, I'm not <laughs> forcing you to throw yourself on the mic each time. Um, yeah, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Don't get too cozy. Uh, yeah, I think about um, there's a difference in martial arts between, uh, in Chinese martial arts, between inner and exterior kung fu, like nei gong and wai gong. So, there are styles that are all about you know, big flashy where you put your arms and you know, what kind of moves you're doing with your body. And there are styles that spend a lot more time focusing on your inner mechanics. Exactly what is your joint supposed to be doing right now? How is the power being generated? And the, those are styles more like uh, Tai Chi or Bagua Zhang or something like that. The joke here is that an, an entirely external style that doesn't understand the internal work um, is hollow. You know exactly what you're supposed to do with your arm or with your leg, but you don't know why. And because you don't know why, as soon as you end up in a situation where you have to behave in a way that you have to solve a problem that you've never seen before, you, it falls apart. Similarly, if all you do is spend all of your time thinking about like, how do my muscles work? Or how do my hips move? It, like, uh, you know, you can get in some sorts of inner styles then you don't actually know how to solve those problems at all. So you're always starting from whatever position fascinates you in a particular book, and then you have to find the other thing. If what you have is this beautiful picture of a world, the question is, where is the blood in it? Where is the heart in it? And if, conversely, what you have is this beating raw heart, you need to find the sort of armature that it fits. Where does the heart live? It can't just hang out on the table bleeding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think absolutely you, you need to find that balance. And, and I'm from the world of Tai Chi. I, have a, I had a sort of academic writing education. I have an MFA in where we all write stories about like men who are getting divorces, right? So that's, um, you know, that's, that's just, the, it's the character and their tormented thoughts about their, you know, how they used to love their wife, but now they don't or whatever. Um, and I think that in that milieu, genre fiction is frowned upon and big ideas and the armatures of, of world building sometimes are not encouraged. Uh, and so for me, I started from a big idea, but I approached it like a quiet literary fiction writer. And that, that may be frustrating to some readers, but both parts of the story were really important to me. And um, it, was, it was fun to, I, I guess like if you, the thing about world building is if you have come up with the idea of a world in your own head, then you have to introduce it somehow. And it, it, you, it's natural to introduce the world through the people who live in it. I, I really don't like a book that starts with like three chapters about <laughs> the history of you know, space travel or something like that. Like, so so you, there's got to be people who live there and they have to feel real and they have to maybe be going through a divorce in the middle of the time war. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. 
I, I'm growing more afraid of the mic as it makes noises. <laughs> Okay. Maybe um, we could all put our heads together. Yeah, let's just do this. That would be cool. <laughs> it's like the Andrews sisters. <laughs> um, so uh, a, a fun question that I like to ask, it might be hard to answer spur of the moment. Um, do you put secrets or Easter eggs in your work? And if so, could you tell us one? <laughs> hmm. I don't know. My book has a beautiful Easter egg that has nothing to do with me, and, and it's the cover, uh, because it is about a fictional book called The Pyronauts. The designer designed this inner cover. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so cool. Can I see that? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and it's also interesting how so people either find it right away or they never, ever find it. There, there are two kinds of readers. There's people who just strip the book right away, and then there's other people who just leave it on in perpetuity. I'm really looking forward to the future high school student who's going to run into this <laughs> in the library without the dust cover on. That's so great. Um, I make a ton of in-jokes that I'm expecting at any given moment, like basically my friends to get. Uh, the, I try not to, in a way it's, um, any book is a conversation and any conversation is taking place on a lot of different levels. Um, ideally, if you're having a conversation with some of your friends and a bunch of people who are not your friends, you may find yourself tempted to make a joke that your friends will get. Um, but if you make that the point of the story, then only your friends are going to be laughing and everybody else is going to be looking at you totally blank-eyed. So what I try to do is slide things in so that somebody who knows or gets the illusion is going to be excited about it. Somebody who doesn't will skate by not necessarily realizing what they've missed. Um, so in my craft sequence novels, which are sort of secondary world fantasy novels, I was a big fan as a, as a young guy of uh, Dan Simmons' Hyperion duology, and there's this character in there, the Shrike, who's a time-traveling monster who's made of you know, sort of glass and has four arms and impales people on thorns and is all sorts of good nightmare fodder. And the craft sequence are sort of business fantasy. It's a post-industrial fantasy world, and people do things like go to meetings with you know skeletal sorcerer kings and then have to get on the airplane and work on their PowerPoint deck afterward. And the Shrike has shown up in every one of those books. He's like often you know, holding a suitcase waiting to get on the airplane or like getting a cocktail being depressed later on, that kind of thing. But since the milieu is such that in this world that a sort of glass spiky time, well, he doesn't time travel in the books, but um, a you know, giant glass spiky monster creature wearing a business suit is not out of the ordinary, seems to blend right in, then uh, ideally a reader's not going to think What's Max doing there? This is just a joke that I'm not getting. Um, writing Time War was amazingly fun because um, Amal and I could just make weird literary jokes to one another all the time. And since the characters are time travelers who jump between a bunch of different timelines, then it's explicable and character supported. And you know, the readers who get it will be very excited by it, and the readers who don't get it will assume that this is weird time traveler stuff, <laughs> one hopes. Are there fake ones mixed in there too? Like real literary references and fake literary references to time traveling literature we don't know? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a joke uh, later on, this is one of Amal's, but I love it so much, um, that uh, Blue, one of the central characters, likes going to productions of Romeo and Juliet in different timelines because she wants to see how the endings are different. Like, you know, maybe it's a comedy this time, you never know. <laughs> It's like opening a Shakespeare Kinder Surprise Egg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to ask one more question and then open it up. Um, but do you want my philosophical question or a more fun question? Oh, I think philosophy fun, is fun. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, could I could argue that the philosophy is fun. But um, how about, uh, have you done extensive research of any kind? for your writing, um, and could you share a fun fact, either that made it in or didn't? I, I love research for writers, it's great. I had to do a lot of BSing, so again, um, my book takes place 
in our world, but most of the primary characters come from a world that diverged from ours in around 1900. So they're experiencing a lot of new things and they're thinking, they're comparing, constantly comparing their own home with the place they find themselves in. And I had to do a lot of research to find out what had happened before 1910 and what had happened after so that I would know what those differences would be. And then the other people involved in my book, in my publisher, had to like fact check that stuff as well. So uh, I had one fun fact that I learned was when, do, maybe, maybe folks know this, when do you think light beer was invented, before or after 1910? After. Yes, like about when? You're correct. 1918. Okay, anybody else want to guess? 1943. It's like the 70s, it's really oh. late. Yeah, I was, I was just shocked. I mean, I, was, I thought maybe there would be light beer in the other world or whatever, but like I, I was thinking, when I learned there wasn't, I thought, okay, 1925 or something. But yeah, 1970 is when light beer was invented. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of that kind of research. I was advised at one point by my Tai Chi instructor. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a recommendation for a Tai Chi instructor? <laughs> no, okay. no. Um, that, that I should talk to a scientist and figure out how alternate universes and gateways through them might actually work. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I still don't know, and, and the science is very, very shaky. I didn't do that kind of research. But I had fun learning about the 20th century, and I had a lot of fun inventing an alternate version of the 20th century, where the big geopolitical tension was between um, North America and Latin America, mm. um, and where you know thousands, of, millions of Chinese people died of an epidemic that didn't exist in our world, and where Joseph Stalin was never born, and you know all, all kinds of big serious differences and also little fun weird differences like you're you know like the trains in new york are above ground but you're not allowed to bring your dog anywhere in new york so the characters are horrified at how many animals there are like people's pets yeah that's all i got can i ask a nerdy question about this book which i'm now super excited to read uh, it was already on my list but man um so like if the 20th century is going differently after 1910. Uh, obviously, like, uh, sort of modernism works differently and literary movements work differently, and then you're writing about a book that's in that literary tradition. How did you think about that, or was that an element in, in your world building? Well, one excellent thing about setting the book in our world is I didn't have to explain every single thing. You know, like, there's yeah. like a lot of stuff that I can kind of, if the characters aren't thinking about it, then it doesn't need to be explained. But I think the, um, the, character who wrote the book is a marginal figure and um, his book is like extremely well known but not and part of the literary canon but not highly regarded <laughs> um, and I think that that mirrors how a lot of probably mid-century real life sci-fi writers the position they found themselves in uh, so I didn't I guess I didn't do too much I, I, I guess I did, wasn't too imaginative with how um, the way people value different types of writing um, with how that went. But, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Thanks. Um, research. So I do a lot of it. Um, generally, I'm not realizing that I'm doing it at the time. For some of the craft sequence books I knew, like this has to be about options trading, so I guess I'm going to go learn a lot about options trading and skeletons right now. Um, <laughs> But I think, personally, I think some of the best research that you can do is um, accidental or serendipitous research. There's a quote, and I'm honestly forgetting who it's from, uh, that uh, you know, the, the word that you'll find in the thesaurus or the dictionary when you're looking for it is never the, actually the opposite word, like the word that your subconscious really wants you to be using that's the most appropriate for that sentence at that moment. It's... Um, you, know, you can construct a word, you can go and find one, but there is the right one that's already in your head somewhere. Uh, and I think that's often true about facts or interesting pieces of data that will go and form your story. It's that down there in your storytelling imagination somewhere. The question is to go look for it. So, for example, I was attending a talk by a um, forensic examiner. Um, at ReaderCon back in, gosh, it must have been 2012 or 2013, and the, uh, she made an analogy when she was discussing uh, extracting the brain of uh, corpse when you're doing a forensic examination, 
as you know, you sort of you saw open the head in this particular way, and there's a bunch of gory details there. And then the brain sort of will slip out, and it's a lot like catching a baby when you're delivering it. And it's like, I don't know what that's going to be, but it's going to be something. <laughs> you just file it back there, have some nightmares, and then it becomes part of the book. A writing teacher of mine calls that the uninventable detail. Oh, that's a wonderful yeah. phrase. Oh, cool, the uninventable detail. And you can kind of sell the rest of it if you know that. Yeah, right, yes, yes. Yeah. No, no one would ever um, think to say it except if someone yeah. who'd been there. That's so cool. Thank you for that. All right, so hopefully someone out there has some questions. <laughs> Did you, in the back of your mind, forefront of your mind ever think I really can't file off the serial numbers of this time travel story or we really can't talk about this because it's already been done by this property not really um, we knew that the driving there were Time travel is such a well-trodden genre. Um, obviously, you've got things like Doctor Who, you've got Fritz Leiber's The Big Time going way back, but it's also a really popular genre in spaces that we don't, th or a popular sort of theme in spaces that we don't think of as genre spaces, right? The time travel romance or time travel literary fiction is many and myriad. Uh, you've got Outliner, Outlander, you've got Time and Again, Time After Time, um, Time Traveler's Wife, obviously. Uh, so there was so much of that in the atmosphere that what we really wanted to focus on was the relationship between these two characters. And we also wanted to f have, um, because the characters were coming from very different places, like I think any two people who end up in an intense relationship are, um, we wanted to have a sense of the wide range of differences of the universes that they were coming from. So that suggested some other things that had to be true about the world and created the kind of multiplicity of times and places that we're working with here. And that in itself kind of pulled us away from a whole set of time travel stories and pulled us toward a whole other set of time travel stories. I guess the core of it is that we wanted red and blue to be the heart of the story. And we knew if they were there and they were strongly in focus, sure, we would veer close to some time travel stories and away from other ones. Um, but the book would remain itself. As a like, follow-up part B to that, there's also a lot of alternate parallel universe stories. Did that sort of thing concern you when you were writing Famous Men Who Never Lived? As a reader of alternate universe stories, I just want more alternate universe <laughs> stories. And I think that's the whole idea, is like in a multiverse, any, there can be 10 million versions of you, you know, that have different breakfasts or whatever. So I, I don't know. I, I guess I hope I'm staying, um, you know, staying away from cliche, but I wasn't too wor It seems like such fertile ground, and I think that people have an appetite for kind of marveling at the differences that are possible, uh, even within one made-up alternate universe, for instance. So I, I think that the literary canon can, can bear more. <laughs> yeah. How do you sort of balance Did everyone hear the question? It was basically when you're world building, how do you how do you balance pulling from existing cultures and also respect those cultures and go kind of beyond and create beyond them? <laughs> <laughs> I answered the last one first. This one's on you. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I think I'm I'm writing, I'm playing about the idea of the culture of what New York City is like. So I used to live in New York. I don't know if other people have lived there or visited. And um, it, you know, like the cliche is that it's a melting pot. And this is, it's a city of immigrants or a country of immigrants. Everyone here who isn't a native indigenous person of the Americas is an immigrant of some kind. Um, and New York especially is full of transplants. And this is a book about people from another version of New York who are in our New York. Um, so 
I think that's, that's the culture I was playing with, is like our New York and this other New York, which is similarly, since it, ha it shares the exact same history until 1910, it's similar, has a similar makeup. Um, so I wasn't too worried about being respectful because it felt like enough my own culture that I could use it and twist it and play with it. Um, but I do think, hmm, I'm, I'm talking myself into a corner here. <laughs> Boy, Max would never do that. No, I, I do that all the time, trust me. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just think, um, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> do I think anything? I, um, yeah, so I, I was, I think it's a, it was a familiar place for me. I can imagine a made up world that because it's further from 21st century US would have to be, um, like I think a lot of second world fantasies are drawing upon particular historical you know, cu cultures, um, whether it's Western history or non-Western history, but I, I felt like I'm writing about our modern world that's just slightly twisted. So I didn't run into that too much, but I had fun thinking about what makes our world distinct and what we might miss if we were to be taken away. I've been amazed by all the, I, I grew up um, in the 90s and there's so much 90s nostalgia floating mm. around right now. Yeah. If you're about my age, you can take a quiz online to find out like what Trapper Keeper you should be. <laughs> or, you know, what, um, what character you are from Saved by the Bell, like as, as if these are these cultural treasures that, you know, are super important to examine over and over again. So even, even those of us who are only 20 years removed from that time and, and Saved by the Bell hasn't gone anywhere, we can still stream it anytime <laughs> we want, probably. Um, but we have this deep nostalgia for that. And I wanted to think about what weird things that don't exist someone from another world would miss, what's their Saved by the Bell? And what would they think when they first saw our Saved by the Bell? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's sort of answered your question. It's a really good question. Oh man, yeah. I, it's weird to start seeing 90s dances be a thing. Mm. You know, I don't 90s think Halloween costumes. Your kid will be dressed up as a 90s person. Oh gosh. Yeah. I am a 90s person. <laughs> it's terrifying. Shouldn't dress like that. I remember the prints I used to have, my god. Um, so this is a, since I write more secondary world fantasy and I write also far future and sort of a, a number of different alternate or played the changes on sort of cultures and storylines, this is a thing that I encounter a lot. And everyone who's writing in the genre needs to find their own answers for it and their own approach. For me, I try to keep subjects very clearly in mind and also keep in mind the community that I'm writing for. Um, I try to picture if I'm depicting a character who's unlike me in some, in some way, uh, a friend of mine who would eventually pick up the story and then read it and sit down with me and have a conversation afterward. Or if I was showing my buddy this page, what would she think? Because she's going to see it eventually. Um, you just, if you can envision the expression on that person's face as you're writing the line, it is not going to save you from everything, but it will guide you a lot. That's been my experience at the very least. Picturing a person who's like you or a person who's unlike you? No, a, picture, a person who's unlike me. So, for example, if I'm depicting a central character who's different from me in their race or their sexuality or something, it's very important for me to like, think of a friend that I have, a pretty close friend who's, a, who's like that person in yeah. some way, um, and just envisioning handing them the manuscript and sitting there across from them as they're reading it, and just what's the expression on their face as they're going through. Um, you can catch a lot of stuff if you are able to envision someone with that level of depth and honesty. Like that, maybe their reaction will be, "Hey, you know, screw you, flip over the table." Like, how could you possibly write this thing? Um, so that's I, I, I use that as guidance when it comes to changing things from cultures as or, or changing historical events. 
I try to follow through causes and effects and material consequences. Um, if the culture that I'm drawing some inspiration from has a cultural ritual that involves a very stratified hierarchy, what role is that serving, um, that hierarchy serving? Where does it come from in that society? How has it changed over time and what forces have caused it to change over time? If I change the culture's material conditions in some way, if I take a giant fundamentally landlocked space and drop it onto an island, how does that change? Um, if I take fundamentally Viking cultural motifs and drop them into uh, a space that looks a lot like Mongolia, like uh, arguably Tolkien does with the Rohirrim, uh, what, what changes, why does it change, and what second, third, fourth, fifth order sometimes consequences are going to come of that. Uh, so between those two, just the sense of trying to powerfully center people that I know and have a lot of empathy for, and then turn around and obviously then you show them the book and you're like, how did I do? Did I, what did I screw up? Or like, please give me your most honest answer and hope that they're going to do that. And then starting to think more analytically also about what you're changing and what the sort of Jenga-like consequences of that change might be. So you said you come from an MFA background. What drew you to genre? Uh, just in case anyone didn't hear, the question is, for coming from an MFA background, what drew you to genre fiction? I've always liked to read it. I like to watch it on TV, and I don't know. I had a big idea. It actually, this sounds really weird, but it came to me in a dream. <laughs> um, and you have to awesome. save that stuff and, and write it down, uh, and then come back to it in a few years if it's still with you. So yeah, I think, um, I mean, there, of course, literary fiction can be all different kinds of ways as well. And, and I think we shouldn't let ourselves be pushed around by what we've already seen. And we shouldn't write about a suburban divorce unless we really, really <laughs> feel like we have to. So um, I wish more, um, more people would write all different kinds of, of work. Not that they're, you know, that of course there's wonderful genre writers who are extremely sophisticated and intelligent who are already doing that work. So I, I think that coming from a more literary background, I run the risk of like seeming like I, thinking I invented something when I don't know very much about it or, or something like that. But I think that like these, these borders should be more porous and I really enjoyed, um, I enjoyed writing something that was a little bit outside of my comfort zone and then talking to different kinds of fans and um, different, existing in a different kind of space. And um, yeah, I, it's, been, it's been a good experience for me. And, and it was just like following an idea that I thought was, that I couldn't resist writing. Can I ask you a sub-question actually yeah. on that? Um, do you think, as somebody who hasn't spent a lot of time in the MFA universe, um, do you feel like what I think we've historically thought of as genre tropes are becoming more and more a part of the um, literary fiction conversation? Is that an even a fair categorization to make? I think probably, yeah. I mean, I think because, you know, whatever, everyone, everyone and their mother is watching Game of Thrones, even if you haven't read it, sure. in, and probably you've read it too, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's funny how we have access to all the information in the world <laughs> on the internet and yet we exist on the internet in these kind of lanes and there's, mm -hmm. there's jokes that are common in certain circles that people outside that circle wouldn't understand. Uh, so I think yes and no. I'm, I'm definitely not an authority but I, I think you know, these genre tropes have, have made their way into pop culture and yet there's always going to be uh, genre, and I think it's it's a nice thing about being part of that community is like having your own language and and having being able to make a joke that people around the world will understand and then uh, that will go completely over other people's heads. <laughs> I think this is what you're talking about with yeah. the Easter eggs a little bit. Yeah. Like, you're not just talking about your friends; you're talking about your reader, like yeah. your ideal reader gets this stuff, and your you know other lovely readers still enjoy your book, but don't get every single moment of it. Each reader is ideal in their own way. <laughs> yes, yeah, of course. All right, uh, unless there's another burning question out there. I, don't know. I think there's so much that I want to talk to you about, but we'll do that another time. I have a quick question for Max. How angry is Juno Diaz? 
Diaz? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, I don't know Juno Diaz at all. Um, uh, He's got bigger problems. Exactly. Well, that. Uh, <laughs> yep. There is that. Um, and, that, and that was like weird. We'd sort of committed the title for the book and like there were designs and people had announced it and stuff after that happens like, oh shit, okay, wow. Um, but uh, honestly, when we were kicking around possible titles for this book, it got like, there were four pages of them and hours and hours of argument. And um, one of the cores of the, uh, so the reference, of course, to, for those of you uh, out there in TV land who haven't, is there's a Juno Diaz novel called This Is How You Lose Her. Um, and we were kicking around basically iterations of this that sounded, they got to the fact that this is a book that cares a lot about language and a book with a kind of poetic and literary sensibility. It's not just a bunch of time travelers running around and going pew pew laser guns at each other. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that as an avid consumer of time traveler pew pew laser gun fiction. Um, but it's, it's not that book and if somebody picked it up expecting even the big time they would be possibly uh, sorely and, and unfortunately disabused very quickly. So we were throwing around titles that felt uh, literary um, and one of the things that always feels literary to me is a lot of small words in the title I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, the cabin in the house between the lake and the woods that has a bear in it but not quite inside it just more like on the front doorstep you know that kind of thing <laughs> um, and, and, and this we, we hit on this one and uh, I don't know for me at least it was like oh that sounds really good and so that's where we are I never made that connection, you know? I've like read that other book, yeah. but I loved the title of this book and it never occurred to me as a reference. Thank you. Well, it wasn't, honestly, intended as a reference. You're just sort of riffing on short, bunches of short word titles and that's what happened. Can I ask a question? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Max, what's it like to write with a co-author? And, and so it sounds like this is epistolatory between two characters and maybe you and Amal wrote different characters, but who, writes, who wrote the narration? Semi-epistolatory. <laughs> Epistolary? I don't know. Uh, God, there's probably a dictionary around here somewhere, and if I hadn't been bad-mouthing dictionaries earlier, I could reach for one. Um, but now that whole avenue is closed to me. Uh, well, so we wrote two characters throughout. Um, Amal wrote blue and I wrote red, and we wrote both the scenes in which those characters were receiving letters and the letters that they were then writing in response. So. Uh, we would sit e across from each other. We were very fortunate. We were able to be on a writer's retreat together, physically present in the same gazebo, working on this <laughs> for, for a couple weeks at the beginning of the project. And uh, I was on one side of the desk and Amal was on the other. And we would start, uh, I'd start writing, for example, this opening section in which Red is receiving a letter and Amal would start writing the letter. And when we were done, we'd swap and read what the other one had written. We'd discuss the, the forms of the letters a great deal. One of the kind of running themes in the book is that the letters take many forms. It's not just a sheet of paper. There's a scene where blue leaves a letter for red encoded in the rings of a tree. There's um, uh, sort of pomegranate seeds that unfurl. There's a micro dot of tea that becomes a you know, letter when you read it at significant magnification. All these kinds of the weird jokey letters that in some ways like you, you may have sent to your friends in school, right? The like elaborately coded ones or the ones that are like hidden in the knot in the back of the tree. Um, but the kind of things that time travelers would do for one another if you had access to thousands of years to prepare an <laughs> obscure joke note for somebody. This is what you would do. Um, so we discussed the form, but we wouldn't discuss the details of the reception, and we wouldn't discuss at all, ever, the content of the letter. Uh, so Amal, uh, that first time I remember, I was going like typity, 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 really fast, as is my want. And Amal, who is a poet by training and, and inclination, also an amazing fiction writer, but uh, I, I, I sort of take to heart the like old school genre hammering on the keyboard until a book appears and takes shape um, approach and Amal was you know considering tap 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 consider delete 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 <laughs> consider mm. tap, tap, tap 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 enter and I'm sitting here like just oh shit I'm really fucking this up aren't I <laughs> I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I'm sorry posterity um, <laughs> 
of course, Amal, I later learned, is sitting there thinking exactly the same thing. She's thinking like, you know, oh God, you know, he's writing so quickly, what's going on with me? But of course, at the end of this, uh, you know, we were, when we were both done, we turned, swapped, and it was just amazing to read this whole extra part of this book that had taken shape while the other person was working on it. And then over the course, this is like it gets a, a little uh, eerie almost even, over the course of writing um, in those two weeks, uh, I found myself slowing down naturally. And she found herself speeding up naturally to the point where there were a lot of letters of different lengths where we'd finish at almost exactly the same moment, like within a minute of each other. It was cool and strange. <laughs> Perhaps everyone should write a gazebo with a friend. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Strong recommendation. Yeah. Have you ever been to a wedding where, you know, the two people getting married have each prepared vows in secret, and the first person goes, and it's like <gasps> funny and profound and beautiful, and then the second person goes, and it's like really horrible, and it's also <laughs> somehow much longer, right? And you're like, I, I wonder, like, I think you need a trusted friend to read every, e even if you want to surprise each other with the vows, you need a trusted friend to read both the vows and be like, okay, yours needs to be, like, funny. <laughs> um, and you need to say something nice about the person you're marrying yeah. so that it will match. Um, like, did, did you have, like, a, did you have to sort of, I mean, not that one of you is, like, the lame one and one of you is the <laughs> awesome one, but, like, did you, did you have to make adjustments, you know, after the initial drafting? Um, we, we did go through some edits, but um, we were each editing our own respective work and there was editing our own work sort of in uh, sort of response to themes that had emerged from the other person. Now, I think there was a feeling of sort of mutual daring and competition that was going on that was also very helpful in the progress. So, unlike the, the vows example, and I've been to those weddings there, <laughs> interesting. Um, Unlike the vows example, since it's an iterative game here, it's almost like the two of us are each making a move in secret, and then we turn around and make a move again in secret, and then we make another one and another one. Each move could be a response to the previous. So I was like, oh, Mal's doing this really interesting language stuff. Let me, let me really try to get into it. Or that was an amazing joke. I'm gonna set up an even better joke three, three lines down. And that way we were sort of both racing against each other like the uh, like the rabbits in Mulan a little bit just it was really great thank you all so much for coming uh, if you enjoyed this follow the authors I think you're at KHSOK and Max Gladstone Spec Boston is at Spec Boston on Facebook and Twitter um, that way you can find out when exactly our October reading is because the date's not set yet, but we'll have Eric Nunnally and uh, Bracken McLeod, uh, and probably a third guest yet to be announced. <laughs> um, uh, and you can also obviously please support the series by supporting Trident. Uh, we have the author's books, we have the authors to sign said books, and there are plenty of books at the back to grab, uh, so please have at it. Uh, thank you to our authors and thanks again for coming.